Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Music Made Me podcast. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Today we're sitting down with singer-songwriter Ben DeHaan. He's out of the Baltimore area. He's been playing music most of his life on and off. His first band that he started just out of high school called American Diary did pretty well. They played the Warp Tour a couple of years, and he actually has a pretty funny story about how they actually got their foot in the door that first year. He left the band and went to work a day job to make some money for quite a few years, but now he's back with a solo career. So please enjoy singer-songwriter Ben DeHaan. Did you grow up in the Baltimore area then? I did. Yep. I uh, I grew up in a, a suburb between uh, Baltimore and D.C. Um, oh, okay. Called Gambrels. Um, but when we were early on, like in the music scene and, and still now, I mean, um, spent a lot of time in Baltimore. And D.C. Has a, has a killer scene, too. I mean, with, uh, you know, Salad Days, like Fugazi, like the original punk scene, like um, a lot of bands came out of, you know, uh, D.C., like Henry Rollins. Right. And how, how close were you to that uh, era of, of that punk scene growing? Was, was that in your wheelhouse of when you were getting into music or was that uh, a little before your time or where did that come in? Uh, sure. So it, it was a little bit before my time, um, but it definitely has been in my wheelhouse. It's like my, my core, you know, um, influences. What age was it where you started to kind of take notice of the scene and what was out there? Um, I, I guess I, I, it changed a lot. Um, throughout the years and it's always evolving. Um, when I was first, you know, introduced into music, there was a pretty big uh, scene here in Annapolis actually, um, where, you know, bands like Geppetto, Good Charlotte, um, Wakefield used to play all the time um, because that, that was their big swell. And then um, later on into, my latter years of high school, um, you know, bands like All Time Low, my old band American Diary, um, you know, Dropout Year, we kind of created a hotbed in Baltimore, like Towson area. And with American Diary, when did you guys form? Was it a high school thing? Did you guys meet in high school? So Reader and I met in middle school. We actually weren't in a band together until my junior year of high school. I had also met... Um, my one of my best friends Ryan Asenti, um, and we were in a kind of like a screamo band at the time, oh, slash okay. like punk. Um, <laughs> I we we it's the one band that we never had. Uh, I don't have any recordings from, but um, <laughs> so we were playing out, and um, Brandon Ingley, the lead singer of American Diary, emailed all of us. He had saw us at uh, like a show or something. He was like, "I'm starting a new band." Um, and I want you guys to all be in it. And then basically we started out as like a seven person band and then whittled down to uh, four over the year years. I think there's probably like 20 different members really or, around that. Yeah. In American Diary. But like for the long haul, it's it's been, you know, me, Brandon, uh, Reader and Mikey. Yeah. And when did you start recording, um, you know, going into it? as an actual project of, you know, this is what we want to do with our lives. This is where we want to take it. This is our band. Let's hit the road and get going. So I'll back up a little bit. I mean, I knew as soon as I started writing songs, which is probably when I was like 12. Oh, okay. Um, and, you know, just pulling up, I always have this, this memory that I like to revisit of just pulling up at like the first show and like, I don't know that 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 feeling that you get like it, it's just kind of like I can't believe I'm going to be playing right now in front of people. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and was that with the Screamo band? Was that your first like no. show? My first band was um, a band called A New Hope, uh, and we were more like I don't know, uh, like pop punk, just straight pop punk. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
what mm-hmm. was that first show like? Do you remember where you played and how many people were there? Well, my first performance ever was a uh, it was a talent show in seventh grade, and it was uh, I played all the small things. But my first real show it was at Woods Holy Grounds. It was like a, a a rec center basically, but like it was there was definitely like a scene there. Like when big bands came through, like a lot of people would show up. And I remember, I think there were maybe like 20, 20 kids there, but like, I was just like, so, I don't know, stick, you know, like, it's, it's like that, uh, like that, that butterflies feeling and like, yeah, it was cool. That's something that I like to come back to a lot because like, it reminds me of the simplicity of, of this. And is it easy to lose that along the way? So easy. It's so, it's so easy to, to lose that, uh, actually you i think you actively have to try not to lose that uh, right i mean i think a lot of musicians i, I talked to a lot of friends that say things like I, I can't even remember why i got into this in the first place and like i'm not in this to like you know do like social media like like all the time and like respond you know it's like a, it's always evolving but it's easy to lose and so i you know i have a reminder on my phone just to to revisit certain memories and that's one of them with american diary what was the process like from when you started recording to sort of when you sort of hit the mark where you knew it was going to be feasible to be a band and start touring and i know you were on the warp tour for a few years and when did that all kind of form between when you formed as a band and then when that success came um so yeah we we uh like i said we started the spring spring break of junior year of high school is when we came together and then we started recording um and then you know we had some local stuff that was um i don't know we got some local attention we were playing with uh you know the bands around here again which were like all time low and you know burning rosewood and uh underscore was a big band back then i had known since i was young that that's what i wanted to do I went to like community college for a semester because we weren't touring and I was like, I'm kind of wasting, you know, my money. So like, we should just do this. And um, we started just making certain commitments. Like, and, and when I look at them in retrospect, it makes so much sense of like how success would grow from there. But I didn't understand it at the time. Like, for example, practice every day no excuses like one hour at least every day so if you do one hour every day of practice like you're gonna get better you're gonna write songs you're gonna be tighter um you know uh set a songwriting schedule release an album um so like basic stuff but that was probably around like 2006 when we released our our full length 2005 we were building that momentum um and playing like every show we could and you know paying to play kind of thing selling tickets everything um but uh yeah no american diary was a really really grassroots um experience and the the best education that you could have in uh learning what it takes as being a diy artist or band because like you're responsible for your success and your success is based on your fans and your relationships with them. And it's going to take a lot. And how difficult is that to figure out when you're like, what were you in your early twenties, late teens when all that was happening or. I was 18. I remember I, it was sometime between like that Christmas and new year's. And I was just like racking my brain. I was like, I'm doing everything I can, I think. And like, I realized that like, I was waiting on other people to become team members, like a label or like a manager or or something to like solve the problem. 
and then I, I I had this this thing come into my mind that like again I have a reminder on my phone that says it says my life didn't start happening until I started making it happen for myself. I had this like realization like what am okay well I, maybe I should you know make it happen then <laughs> like right. you know stop stop just writing songs and, and waiting and you know maybe I should be reaching out and building a fan base and, and what was it like in those days because there was no social media back there and was there yeah we had myspace oh, oh myspace <laughs> was up <laughs> mm-hmm. but I guess as it was much future as we, music back then yeah as, as, as much as we look back on that time and kind of laugh at myspace it was a pretty big deal for oh bands right God. it was the thing it was the thing I think a lot of bands myself included we're like, oh, what do we do now? Because like, how do we connect to fans? And well, I mean, I, I can't speak for other artists. I'm just saying like, I, I definitely felt that shift um, because, you know, people people used to go to MySpace for music for, for a period of time. It's so funny because like, I totally forget about that, but that was such the engine, you know, aside from, we did a lot of, you know, paving the concrete and going out to shows and meeting people. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know I, I've heard bands talk about my space and like sitting there for hours, just like getting back to messages and like managing that whole thing. Yep. <laughs> yep. We had, uh, <laughs> we had shifts. We would have, uh, okay. Uh, you know, this is, I don't know. I think at one point we had to break it down into like hours of the day, like while we were touring, because, but it would, it started out as my day, Brandon day, reader day, Mikey day oh, of responding. Okay. You have to respond <laughs> to every person. And so how did Warp Tour come around then? Oh uh, yeah. So it's an interesting story. We did what a few bands were doing at that time and just, just walked in and, or drove in with uh, like the, you know, bus brigade and um, we looked the part and everything and just walked in and I can't believe like, it's so crazy. Cause like, yeah, I mean, we just walked in by the end of that day, we basically got called out and caught and they were like, okay, well, we appreciate you know, kind of like your drive. So here's here's the deal. Like you can work catering and, you know, make lunches for the, the truck drivers and we'll put you on the skate room stage. And that's basically what we ended up doing for the next three months. So when you say you just like walked in, like, do you mean you like just back in the backstage area sort of thing? Like just acting like a band and going into that backstage area? After that day, we, we all got laminates and stuff and because, you know, I mean, we were working, but we were also, you know, on the tour. Right. But yeah, I mean, like we drove in with the brigade of bosses and, and vans. You know, we had a van and trailer. We were touring. Um, we were no strangers to touring at that time. <laughs> we looked the part. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like we just walked in like through those fences, you know, and uh, nobody said anything, <laughs> <laughs> but we, uh, we paid our dues. I'll tell you, we, we paid our dues for sure. I mean, we were out there not only, uh, you know, playing every day, a lot of times in like a hundred plus degree weather and doing it in a van without air conditioning, you know, that, that tour is meant to do in a, in a bus, I'll tell you, but, um, obviously we couldn't afford it yet but uh um you know in between playing we would be either you know working helping with catering or you know selling cds just grinding non-stop like it was a serious serious grind like and i know it is like and we met a lot of cool people like i mean you know we got close with the angels guys and and, and tom and it was just taking that chance. Um, a lot of bands just got kicked out of there, but like we were given the opportunity to actually stick on and, you know, we paid off. And how many years did you play on the tour? We only did 2007 on the Ernie ball stage and then 2008. 
Because I quit in December of 2008. Oh, okay. And you said you quit in 08. And I was, I was looking and I thought you were, you guys were still going as of last year. So I was going to ask you if you were still a band or if your solo stuff had taken over. So what, in 2008, were you moving in that solo direction already? Or what was that shift? Where did you head after you quit in 08? I wanted to go my own direction back then. So I started my own band Life on High when I was 20. Um, and they released the album Theodore, which I, I think is probably the best American Diary album, in my opinion, not with me on it. Um, and it was really cool to to hear that because like I was, me and Brandon and I were the, the primary songwriters um, up into that point. Um, but then, I don't know. I, I kind of just like fell into a little bit of a rut um, of thinking like it would be easier for me just to, I, I, I went back to school and, you know, I got my degree and stuff and that was fun. I mean, like that was fine. Um, and then I entered the work force and I was just really unhappy. <laughs> uh, really like, just like, I remember calling my dad the first day of like, uh, a marketing like sales job that I was doing and I was just like is this how it's gonna be and he was like because I, I was like in gridlock traffic driving home and I was not was not happy he was like yeah pretty much and I was like oh <laughs> so I spent actually I mean more time than I like to admit I it, you know in that world and there, there's nothing wrong with that like I, I you know i mean i i enjoyed you know the, the competitiveness of it and so on and so forth but it, it i was always like me personally like longing for something else like because like i had already had a taste of what i knew i wanted to do and so it actually hasn't even been that long it's been maybe a year and a half that i've been I mean, I, I, the simple of it is like, I was doing this up until September of 2019 and uh, American Dyer was gonna record our first song, I don't know, in like five, no, like eight years with uh, Matt. And I was a regional manager at a staffing, like a global staffing company. And my, my uh, supervisor basically, he, just said like I mean you know if you take the time off to do this you can just stay off <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I was like one of those moments where I was just like uh I don't want to be like 90 and like on my deathbed and be like what if I like had moved forward with like I I, I keep having that deathbed scenario so yeah I since then I've been doing this, uh, this is my full time again. And uh, I spent a good nine, 10 years not. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty big. So what was it like not only coming back, but doing it solo for what, the first time ever? It's totally different. Um, it's really cool uh, in the aspect that like, you call like the creative shots like it's all like your vision um but you start to realize that like when you're in the studio <laughs> it can get pretty pretty exhausting because i used to miss those studio naps you know when brandon <laughs> was tracking bass or reader was doing drums or you know mikey was doing his guitars or it's just like you are in there non-stop you can't take you can't take and you have to listen the whole time because right. there's nobody else going to be listening for you, you know <laughs> um so there's that and also you know i mean it's nothing that i'm not used to you really have to take responsibility for your own success because like you don't have the other members and and like i i'm lucky i do have a very supportful like group of friends and also you know my girlfriend lauren um 
plays cello on most of the the stuff that I do, and she's just mu as much a part of uh, of this as I am. So how is it? How uh, nice is it to have that support? Um, you know, not only from from a partner, but someone who is in it with you and not just kind of standing on the outside looking in it's invaluable it scares the hell out of me <laughs> i always like i didn't know that she played cello until like six months into our relationship oh really yeah yeah she was, I, I think her mom dropped her cello off and she was like oh yeah i play i play too i tell her all the time that i don't think that i don't think that I could do this without her, you know? I mean, I don't know. We're just such a solid team, like, together, and, and, and it's hard. Like, if I could tell my 22-year-old self anything, it would be just like, okay, just breathe. Like, I know, I know this sucks, and, like, you feel, like, super jaded right now. Like, but, like, you'll get through it, and, like, just keep going. Just keep going. How difficult has been that been the past year? Because it was sort of 2019 where you started releasing, um, you know, the bulk of your music. I saw you had one back in 2017, a track. Um, but 2019, it feels like you were really starting to ramp up there. So what was it like hitting 2020? And all of a sudden, as a new artist who's trying to get themselves out there, all of a sudden you're hitting a wall. Right. So, yeah, I had that. Um, I did like a, a three track demo with Paul back in 2016 and I kept one of the songs up. I was still in the workforce at the time. Um, so when, yeah, I came back in 2019 and um, I had made up my mind that I didn't have any other options at that point like i even though i do i just decided like this is what i'm gonna do um because i love it and and like i don't ever really think about going back to my former life um even though i mean like you know it is what it is and i have a lot of friends and great people from back then i just i don't really think about it um and then the second part is like you know with the with the lockdown and stuff I just thought like, great, this is more time that I'm gonna be forced to create. <laughs> like, I literally, and I mean, I didn't really think, you know, great, great, we're in a pandemic. Like I got the anxiety just like all of us. Um, yeah, no, I mean, trust me, I, it, it was, you know, that piece was hard, but um, I, I had listened to a Song Exploder episode, I don't know, probably a week prior to like lockdown officially happening it was the episode with um the guy from semisonic so he wrote closing time in a challenge that he gave himself he wanted to write a song a day for 90 days something like that i don't know if it's, that's exactly correct but i know it was a song a day for a certain amount of time and so in february i started doing that and basically what happened was well, it was a mental shift because it didn't matter like the genre or like if the song was good, but I had to finish it. Like it had to be done. Oh, okay. Okay. So I ended up, the interesting thing is that like I ended up writing a lot of what I think are some of, you know, my best, my best music, like all the stuff that I did with Sam came from that um that that has yet to be released that will be released in you know late february but um it was it was kind of just committing to that process and in that in that outcome i guess um and there's definitely like some some bad songs in there for sure <laughs> there's always gonna be right but you have to let yourself do the bad songs so you can get to the good ones and a lot of times like you'll take great things like maybe even if it's the one thing from that bad song and you'll use it in this other song. Right. And what's the recording process been like for these songs? Are you playing multi instruments and doing most of it yourself? Uh, so usually I am, 
either you know paying a session drummer or we're building beats and then you know i'm playing all the guitars i'm doing all the vocals and either i or the producer will play the bass uh i primarily i i, I work with a guy here um he's in waldorf his name is mike bridget at the monster house he does phenomenal work um the stuff that i just did that is unreleased i did with uh um, sorry, Sam Pura at the at the Panda Studios in in uh, San Francisco. He does excellent work, excellent work. Yeah, he um, he was great to work with. And then my latest single, Miss Cacophony, was done by uh, David Favaza in Baltimore. As far as tracking, um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm doing. It's it's really that's where it's key as a solo artist to have and or build good relationships with producers that you like to work with because they're, they're going to be your best friend or get better with logic or pro tools or Ableton, which, which I have also done as far as like my own demoing. It feels like 2020 kind of has changed things a bit in the way artists are putting out music and because of how easy it is to just put music out now. Right. And artists just wanting to get their music out there when it's ready. So do you see a shift in that or do you think it's just because of the pandemic and things will kind of go back to normal as the world goes back to normal as far as albums go? I know that, you know, there are music fans out there that like a full album as, as just a snapshot, a piece, uh, a statement kind of Um and I, and I and I think that that's really important. Having said that, I think that is for bands that have already established themselves. They have a following. They have people you know, that are going to allow them to operate as a, a business, which essentially they are, right? So with my EP, I'm, I'm going to, because I know, you know, Spotify's algorithms wants you to, to push content in a certain way. So what you're seeing a lot is you'll do a release every six weeks. And then when you near the end of that um, EP or LP, you release it as a, as a full album. Hopefully by that point, you have more music to, to push out and keep that going. Yeah. Yeah, so that I mean, honestly, I mean that's my strategy. I I still love the album. I'm guilty as everybody else is, uh, you know, listening to uh, you know just singles because like God, we're all you know we're just com- competing for attention these days. It's like you almost miss the days when like you put a CD in and you're like, okay, yeah, I know this is one of my front to backs. So, like I can go for this ride. So what is what does the next year look like for you? Um, have you kind of looked that far ahead or do you kind of focus on sort of song by song and kind of period by period throughout the year? I'm more period by period, I would say. Um, so I have, a, I have an EP worth of content recorded right now. It's in the mixing, final mixing process. Um, I'm going to release the first single uh, at the end of February, I'll push a new single out every six weeks up until June. I mean, depending on what the climate is, I am going to be doing a, a festival tour starting in like May and ending in early October. So I'll be doing a lot of touring depending on if I'm able to. Um I suppose around that time, like I'll regroup and I don't know, I, I, I'm always writing. I write every day. So I, I have too much, con- I have too much like <laughs> music to get out. Like it's a, it's just a problem, but um, I, I suppose, yeah, I guess I have like about nine months in the future planned. Okay. And how exciting is it for you as a, a newer solo artist and the landscape 
that we're likely going to go into when things start going back to normal and just the passion that fans are likely going to have just for live shows on a whole because I imagine people are going to be chomping at the bit to see whatever they can see as far as live music goes. And I will be too. Let me tell you, like, cause I don't think you get to be a, uh, you know, a musician of any type of influence without being a huge fan, you know, like that, that is such a big piece of all of this. And, and I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to play. I can't wait to, you know, see artists also. So and yeah. Did you get a chance to play any shows before lockdown? But like in 2019, have you played shows as a solo artist or has it just been recording so far? So, I, I mean, I've done a lot of streams. Um, you, can, you can see I do like a weekly open mic on, on my Facebook. Um, we practice every day. Um, it's just I, I would have been playing out at this point live. But unfortunately, like it was just cut premature. Like it, I was right there, and then like it's like no. Nope. <laughs> so what do you think that feeling is gonna be like? Because what has it been? How many like 12, 13 years since you've actually been on a stage? Uh, you said uh, eight, was it? Uh, let me think. Ah, uh, God, since I've been on, uh, I mean, like I did continue like playing and, and I we did like like small um like weekend tours with the band after that actually no then I was I played bass with a band called the goodnight anthem you know while I was doing like my corporate stuff I I was playing bars and doing covers and stuff which is that's fun too it's fine you know if I have to do that um you know to supplement income I'm happy to do it um but really like god playing as myself live it would have been the last time i guess it would have been with matt when i was 25 we were doing like an acoustic duo um it'd be at least eight years yeah yeah i can't wait <laughs> can't wait this is it right like this is where you want to be that you want to be doing music so yeah that's the path you're on Mm -hmm. and is it is it viable these days i guess if you're willing to put in the work i mean you just said the the magic word i mean yeah i think it is if you're willing to put put in the work it's not like you know i had a tiny nest egg <clears throat> stored for eventually knowing that i think in the back of my mind was going to make this decision um but like i you know i give guitar lessons also like I, but like, I am, I'm grinding every day. You have to put in the work. It's, 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 yes. Your question was, is it viable? Yes. It's as viable as you make it, I think. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is there any plans with American Diary to do anything in the future at this point? Yeah, we, we have talked about, um, you know, doing a little uh, like three song EP in the springtime um so yeah we can watch out for that as well um brandon and uh reader actually closer to you they're up in corvallis oregon oh okay right now. so um they would fly out here and then we would do our thing with i think mike bridget and yeah so you must be pretty excited then heading into the next year or two and just kind of hitting the ground running when you're able to right yeah, I'm uh, running as fast as I can um, with what I've got and uh, no sign of stopping yet. Uh, so, <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to the EP coming and people can catch your music that you've been releasing throughout 2020 on all the music streaming services and on your website and yep. social and mm -hmm. everything like that. Yep. Follow me on Spotify if you want to support. Thanks for joining us and uh, have a great next couple of months. You as well. Okay, right. thanks. Take care. See ya. Bye. Thank you guys so much once again for listening. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ben DeHaan. Be sure to like, share, follow, subscribe to us on whatever streaming service you're on. We really appreciate the support. 
and it helps us to come back each and every week with new conversations with musicians from every walk of life. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time on the Music Made Me podcast.